You're listening to a Monster Kid podcast. <laughs> It's 1900 in Australia. A group of students from a girls' boarding school, brimming with the enthusiasm of youth, embark on what's supposed to be a carefree Valentine's Day outing at the iconic Hanging Rock. The ambience is idyllic and the laughter is contagious. But as the day unfolds, this innocent trip takes a dark turn. Four girls drawn inexplicably to the rock's embrace venture deeper. By sunset, only one returns, her memory erased, and a teacher is mysteriously gone. Behind this masterpiece is director Peter Weir, who fresh from his first full-length feature film, The Cars at 8 Paris, crafts an atmosphere that is seen and felt. The cast led by talents like Anne-Louise Lambert as the ethereal Miranda and Rachel Roberts as the stern Mrs. Appleyard breathe life into Joan Lindsay's iconic novel. But this film isn't just about the mystery of the missing. At its core, Picnic and Hanging Rock delves into the themes of nature versus civilization. The untouched beauty of the Australian wilderness stands in stark contrast to the Victorian era restraints and social expectations the girls grapple with. Themes of time, both its palpable passage on that faithful day and the metaphysical aspects play heavily into the film. It challenges us to consider sexuality, the mysteries of adolescence, and the clash between the known and the unknown. This isn't just a movie, It's a mood, an atmosphere. It's a dreamlike state that lingers, asking viewers to grapple with the line between reality and the ethereal, the known and the unknowable. The haunting soundtrack and the Australian landscape's cinematic beauty craft a visceral and cerebral experience. And today, as we traverse this intricate cinematic landscape, we're joined by Tab, With her unique insights and deep appreciation for film, we're set to embark on a deep dive into this masterpiece. So listeners, join us as we explore, analyse and celebrate the intricacies and enigmas of Picnic at Hanging Rock. G'day and welcome to Odingo Ate My Movie, a podcast that celebrates the weird and wonderful world of Australian film from the 70s, 80s and beyond. As ever, I'm your host, Pete. Today, I'm joined by Tab from the Stiletto Banshees podcast to discuss Picnic at a Hanging Rock. How are you, Tab? Thank you so much. I'm great. I'm excited to talk about this movie because I, I feel like I try to talk to people about it and they've never seen it before. <laughs> Isn't it funny? It's interesting even just talking to like, Friends of mine, we had some friends over last night and they were just asking what we've got coming up. I said, oh, I'm doing a podcast recording tomorrow and we're doing Picnic from Hanging Rock. And they're like, oh, we haven't watched that for years. I haven't seen that for a long time. And even myself, I hadn't seen it for years. Like I saw this, the first time I ever saw this film, I was, it came out in 75. I saw it, I think in 77 or 76 on a school excursion. 
and I think at that age, I was probably um, 13, 14, something like that. It just went right over our heads. I think for that age group, they're not really going to, not really going to understand a lot of it, right? It's vibes the movie is how I described it to my friend Micah because it is very visual, first of all, yeah, yeah. and it's about the atmosphere of it. It has a loose plot, but it's not super dependent on that. <laughs> no, I know. And much has been said about it. It has no ending. Nothing wraps up and there's a wrap up, but there's no clear end. I don't think we're spoiling anything because I think at the very start, you pretty much know that's going to happen. There's yeah, no, I, I don't no, think you can really spoil this movie other than uh, the, some girls on a school trip disappear. Yeah, that's, that's it. But that There's happens no, at the beginning. Pretty much. That's right. There's no spoiling this movie. So anyway, Picnic at Hang Rock was released in 1975 and was directed by Peter Weir. Film stars Anne Louise Lambert, Rachel Roberts, Dominic Gard and Helen Morse. It also features, again in my podcast, a very young John Jarrett. Yeah. And Watch was his second film role. Gosh, he's so, so young in this. I think the youngest I had seen him prior to this was Next of Kin, and he's probably yeah. in his early 30s in that. Yeah, he's really young. I can't remember. I was looking yesterday, and I thought, oh, I've got to write down the name of the first film, and I forgot. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, it's his second feature film, and he, yeah. like I said, he's so young. But you can see... You can see the talent in him in this movie. He's not, he's, yeah, he doesn't yeah. get billing, but he's he's quite good in this film, I think. So. And I think he's, his character is supposed to stick out this way, but everyone else is so like posh and upper crust. And that really sets him apart from, yeah. from everyone else. And I think it's supposed to because he's yeah. like a servant or a, a worker. For yeah, one of the rich like, families. He's the Larrikin Aussie guy in mm -hmm. the movie. Yeah. So the movie was based on the book of the same name written by Joan Lindsay and it was first published in 1967. I've not read it. I actually just bought it on Apple Books last week and, uh, mm, and I thought yeah. I'll try and read it and I knew I wouldn't get through it before this. <laughs> so I started it's to read it. It's very similar. It's very Have similar to it? the movie. Have you read yeah. it? Have you read it? Yeah. A, co a small copy came with my Criterion DVD, so okay. I read it several years ago. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to reading it. And I think if I think about the start of the book even, I think she writes at the start of the book that she says, because the big thing about this movie is they kept asking her all the time, is this a true story or is this mm -hmm. something you made up? And she never really answered the, the question. And she was told, she used to tell people, I think when Peter Weir first went to meet her, he was told by her publicist or publisher mm -hmm. not to ask her whether it was a true story or not, but he couldn't help himself and did. And and at first she said to him, I hope you're not going to ask that question again. But then she said it's she didn't really say. She didn't really right. answer it straight. At the start of the start of the book, it actually basically says it doesn't matter whether this is true or not, because so much time has passed, the people that read this book are dead. <laughs> yeah, it's presented almost like a true crime book yeah. in the way that it's written it's written as if it is a real thing that people talk about at least yeah Maybe not everything in it is true but like so an urban legend kind of thing so i'm looking forward to uh, getting into it and reading it it'll be really good so where to watch it so it's a weird one because in australia i didn't find it on any streaming service for such a seminal australian film yeah it's fun. almost it's really I looked on places where I looked in all the regular places, but then I looked in places where I thought, oh, it'll absolutely be on ABC iView, but no, mm -hmm. it's not there. And then I thought oh, it'll be on uh, the SBS one. Um, so ABC is like our national broadcaster and mm -hmm. SBS is like a, it used to be mostly always foreign films and foreign TV mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And it's still like that, but they have a lot of Australian content as well. And I thought it would be on their streaming service for sure because they have lots of Australian stuff and so does the ABC. And I thought, I'll be on there for sure. So I don't know if there's a rights thing in Australia at the moment, but it's not on any streaming service. You can buy it like on Apple, I think, and things like that or rent it. Right. There's, I ended up having to order a DVD from uh, a seller on eBay. And, oh, wow. Because I was going to order it through Amazon, but it might have been a bit, might not have made it in time. And right. I know there's a 4K on Amazon. I think that's Second Sight released, which looks interesting. And there's a couple of other view, few versions. Funnily enough, I only found out the second viewing 
and watching a um, documentary because the, the DVD I got is super bare bones. It's the movie, mm-hmm. it's uh, the trailer, and that's it. Oh, and wow. there's nothing else on it. So I found a documentary on YouTube that's split into two parts, which I think is off one of the later Umbrella releases. Yeah. And I found out that the version I watched that I got on DVD was the director's cut when he had a second go at the movie a few years later. Oh, wow. Okay. And took some scenes out and things like that. So, yeah, so it's there's not really uh, much there. There's a rumour that Umbrella are releasing a new fully restored 4K before the end of the year. There was a an interview I watched with one of the guys from Umbrella. It was last week and he mentioned that they were working on a, a 4K of a beloved Australian film. Mm. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's that. So if that comes to fruition, I'll definitely pick that up as well. So where have yeah. you been able to watch it? So I noticed that it is currently in the US at least on Max, which would be HBO Max. Oh. So yeah, I saw that it was on Max or HBO Max when I was trying to, I was actually trying to find the miniseries to look at the uh, yeah. And then I have it as a Criterion DVD and I checked the Criterion website and they do have a Blu-ray available, but that may only be, I think it would be Region A for the US. Yeah. yeah. So it would probably be Region Locked, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. But if you're a US listener, there's a couple different ways you can get it, which is surprising. Usually it's the other way around. Usually... <laughs> Europe or Australia has it and we don't. (laughs) Yeah. If you're an Australian listener and you do want to get something from Europe, so if you get something, I think anything from Britain uses the same region as we do. So you can safely buy stuff, I think, that's from the UK. So if you get it off the Amazon UK store or something like that. So, yeah, it's funny because as an aside, when I was looking for this movie, I was looking on ABC Ivy and I found this Nick Cave and Warren Ellis concert at, at Hanging oh, Rock. Oh, nice. And it was really cool. And so I ended up getting totally sidetracked for 30 minutes <laughs> watching We that. just went and saw Nick Cave in Milwaukee I like know, a week I saw ago. <laughs> that. I saw Micah mention that. Was it great? Oh, he was awesome. It was, it was like on the level of, I imagine, seeing somebody like David Bowie or yeah, Tom yeah. Waits or Leonard Cohen. Yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately, like Leonard Cohen and David Bowie, I wouldn't be able to see them because yeah, they're, they're gone now. Gone. But yeah, Nick Cave was amazing. It was just him yeah. and a piano, and then the bass player from Radiohead was like accompanying okay. him. Oh wow, that would have been yeah, great. yeah, it would have been excellent. So the movie had a a budget. I <laughs> missed. I think I yeah, I missed mistyped this. I put four hundred and forty three million dollars in data. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was $443,000 and it's box office. It made $5.12 million in the show, which is actually not too bad theatrically. Yeah, I don't think it cost $443 million. I imagine it would be yeah. quite extravagant. On Rotten Tomatoes, it's 91% and the audience score is 83, which is really high, which is great. And the IMDb rating is 7.4. So I forgot the little letterbox, but I'm um, assuming it's pretty high. So mm-hmm. it's a very well-loved film. I even watched a Siskel and Ebert review of it oh, yesterday. Wow. And I can't tell them apart, I can't remember which one's what, but one of them really loved it, the bigger guy. Is that Siskel? That's Ebert. Ebert, right. Yeah. He really loved it. And Siskel didn't really, he liked the cinematography, loved everything else about it, but he hated the fact, and I guess we'll probably come back to this again, that there was no ending to the movie. Yeah. <laughs> he described it as like having somebody give him a present in a beautifully wrapped box. And when he opens the box up, there's nothing in it. And yeah, and, <laughs> I feel like know. Americans are very literal. And so if you don't have a, a set so, three act story structure and an yeah. unambiguous ending, they're like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you look at the, the documentary on YouTube, or on one of the DVDs or Blu-ray releases, which I'm sure it's on. I think it's one of the McElroys, one of the producers, basically says when they sold it into the US, a lot of the reaction they got was, what the hell's this? It doesn't have an ending. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I think that's what really makes the movie, though, is the fact yeah. that it's so open-ended because you end up watching the movie. And again, and I've said this before on this podcast, there's, you watch this movie and then for the next few days, it's actually milling around in your head. Oh, yeah. And, and you're sort of going, oh, what did happen? What actually did happen to these people? So, And it's 
it not that it's a realistic movie because I don't think that's the intention, but no. in real life there are just things that don't have an ending or don't get solved. Yeah. It's super common. So why wouldn't you have a story that that doesn't it's a mystery that it's not solved? Yeah. That's yeah, more I mean, realistic than mysteries that are solved to in some respect. True. And and the only logical ending this movie could have is they find the bodies. Right. Or or they come back or something, like one of right. them did, right? But, you know, never going to happen. I think it, I like it for that reason. It's good. The novel was originally published in 1967, and after reading the book four years after its release, Pat Lovell, who at the time was a an actress, she did daytime TV and other sorts of things and soapies and stuff, she thought it would be great, would make a great movie, and eventually secured the rights for a total of $300. Wow. In 1973, I think she paid, I think I read that she paid $100 a month for three months or something, and that got her the rights to the book. And then she hired Peter Weir to direct it, and he bought with him Jim McElroy to help produce the film. That team, I think one of them in particular, has produced a lot of these films mm -hmm. in Australia. Like I think Razorback was one that they produced oh, okay. as well. And so they've got a long history with these sort of movies. So Pat Lovell originally wanted David Williamson, screenwriter David Williamson, very well known in mm -hmm. Australia as a writer of screen and stage, to write the adaptation. However, he could never get his schedule to sort of match up. So he suggested Cliff Green, who was a noted TV writer, and he ended up writing the screenplay. And I think it's a good screenplay. It's uh, Yeah. Would have been interesting I, trying to adapt the book, right? Exactly. I, I read an interview with Pat Lovell where she talks about how she had to go to Hanging Rock for for the shooting of the film. And she said it was so eerie that she hated being there. And I think she said she went one other time and it was she felt the same and she's never been back. And she's actually wow. very scared to be there. <laughs> That's really interesting. I'd love to go there one day. I think next time oh, we get yeah. up. Melbourne for a holiday or something, it'd be really good to go and check it out because it looks fantastic. Like just the rocks itself, it's amazing. Yeah, and I, think, I think it's the perfect place for something that feels otherworldly because it does, yeah. it's Look beautiful, but the rock yeah. is very imposing. Yeah, yeah. They started filming in February 1975 and principal photography lasts around six weeks. The locations for the film included Hanging Rock in Victoria, Martindale Hall near Mintaro in South Australia, and the studio of the South Australian Film Corporation in Adelaide. So bits here and bits there, and because South Australia is a different state to Victoria, obviously, and mm -hmm. so they move between the two. But, yeah, it was, it's, it's an interesting shoot. The part of Miranda was originally uh, given to Ingrid Mason. However, after a few weeks of rehearsal, uh, we decided that it wasn't working out, so he cast uh, Anne-Louise Lambert in the pivotal role. From what I recall from the documentary as well, he mentioned that he originally was going to um, hire uh, Anne-Louise Lambert to play the part, but he felt she was a bit too worldly and he mm. wanted them all to be very innocent. And uh, when they started rehearsals and whatnot, he was thinking back to her and actually thought that she would be a better fit in the way that she was, that worldly sort of person. And Because when you look at that character with the other girls from the college, she is completely different in a way in regards to she seems more worldly and she seems, she's almost like the, I don't know, the, it's probably the wrong word to say, but the alpha woman right. or alpha girl of, of the whole group sort of thing. She's someone they all look up to, someone they all like and that sort of thing. Yeah, even the French teacher seems to be sort of fascinated with her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly right. And so she ended up getting the role. When I think about the film, it, it often looks like an impressionist painting. There's oh. certainly a lot of scenes, especially that scene with the girls all just sitting, that long shot with the girls all just sitting around the rock, the base yeah. of the rock. That, that reminds me of a few pieces of art I've seen over the years. And Peter Weir and cinematographer Russell Boyd achieved this kind of dreamlike look by just draping various thicknesses of, of bridal veil fabric over the camera lens, which is quite, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but it's, it certainly makes a difference. Yeah, I read that as well. And I was like, I f they must have just been able to focus the right way where it creates a almost like an inner glow 
for everything and not actually see the lace. But I was really impressed by that. Yeah, it's great. What are your general thoughts on the film? So this movie is so beautiful. I'm a big fan of Anne of Green Gables. And particularly there was a Canadian miniseries that they did several of the books and mashed them together. And the way everyone was dressed really reminded me of that. So I was instantly on board because, oh, I know this time period through other things that I've watched. But it was just beautiful. And uh, the way that they were all sort of reading poetry to each other. I think it was from Valentine's Day cards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that really set the atmosphere right away. It was very dreamlike. And I think it sets it up to be like, there's something off about what's happening yeah. right away before they even get to the rock. So I felt like the atmosphere and the, the setting were really well established. I think there's also a lot of themes in this movie. Like mm-hmm. there's this sort of overarching, almost not sense of dread, but there's that it's a bit off-putting. There's, it yeah. feels a bit strange. There's also a lot of reaching for words here, like looking at relationships between the girls. Mm-hmm. Sarah's relationship or infatuation with Miranda is really interesting part of the movie as well. Right. There's a lot of that going on in the film, and I think it's quite interesting. And the teachers that are there and, and of course, the what would what she call like the headmistress. Oh, it's Mrs. Really, Appleyard, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's really interesting watching her character go from very uptight, upright, sort of in control headmistress at the start of the movie and just watching her descent into mm-hmm. kind of not madness but just like this massive descent into just like disrepair and she's right. out of control and doesn't really know what's going on by the end of the movie. It's just amazing. And she's really well played as well. Yeah. And and her relationship with Sarah too, just the almost like sadistic kind of relationship she has to Sarah where she's punishing for her for things, but it seems more like she is offended by the fact that she's lower class than the other girls. Yeah, that's and what that's I took that's really from what's it. motivating it. Yeah, I took that as well because she, I think all the other girls seem to come from fairly well-to-do families and she's a a uh, you know an orphan and, and I think the sadness one of the sadnesses in this movie that I never picked up until my second viewing is that her brother is actually close by yes, and neither yeah. of them know yeah neither of them know they just never cross paths I thought that was so cool because basically it seems like she comes to him in a dream after she's yeah. died yeah and that was really heartbreaking and they are so close. If she had gone to the picnic, she would have been within like feet of him. Yeah. But also, I loved the way that they distinguished her from the other girls using an Australian accent because the other girls have a more English sounding yeah. accent, at least yeah. to me. And then mm-hmm. she was really the only girl that had a an actual Australian accent. And, yeah. and that sort of seemed like the way they were indicating that she was possibly of a lower class or separate from them. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. She's such a tragic figure too through the whole yeah. thing. It's yeah. so sad. So there's a whole lot going on in this film that's kind of like in parallel with the main storyline. To me that really struck me. I couldn't believe it. I didn't pick it up the first viewing. I obviously didn't pick it up when I was a 14-year-old kid. <laughs> right. <but Yeah>. Back in <laughs> or whatever I was back in 1976 or whatever it was. And even the first time I watched it, I didn't really pick it up. And I was like, hang on, what's going on here? Oh, yeah. it's his sister. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so sad and tragic. It so. is really sad. What was sad to me also was that she was so defiant and clearly wanted yeah. to be an individual and she was just being, like, squashed down. And yeah, yeah. They indicate that she may have died by suicide, but I also read that there's a theory that Mrs. Appleyard killed her because right. she clearly didn't go away with her guardian. Yeah. The way that Mrs. Appleyard said. I'm not sure about that because I, I thought, because she was, to me, what I took from it is she was so infatuated with Miranda and Miranda goes missing. Mm-hmm. When Mrs. Appleyard says to her that we're basically kicking you out of here and you have to go back to the orphanage, yeah. there was almost like, to me, almost like a little smile. Yes. Yeah. From her when she was told. 
And I was like, okay, this is where she made the decision that she was going to kill herself to be with Miranda. Mm-hmm. And that's that was where she got the smile, and I think. That's my take. But this is the great thing about this film is you can see it so many different ways. Yeah, it's open to interpretation for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I said, such a tragic figure. The other character I really liked was the French teacher mm-hmm. played by Helen Morse. She was a great character. And where Mrs. Appleby was firm with the kids that were there, the girls that were there, she was almost like their friend more than anything and she was very close to them and nurtured them and was a really good sort of character yeah. I felt like that a lot of that was because she was so much closer in age to them and then she's yeah. also she looks right like she looks like she should be sitting with them where they even have uh, Miss McCraw uh, in a dress that is very richly colored so it sets her apart from everyone wearing white she yeah. looks like she's in the wrong picture yeah when they're moving the camera across everyone like she's really stands out because she's wearing red and isn't this beautiful young girl (laughs) and it's also interesting that she goes missing as well but you mostly just concentrate on the three girls that are missing there's a couple times in the movie where you forget that she went missing as well oh yeah i did laugh when they were when edith says oh i saw her but Something was wrong, and then she can't say yeah. to the police directly that she was only wearing her underclothes. Yeah, it's quite it, the whole thing's very strange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I guess we started talking about this. One of the the, the features of the movie is it's very open ended. The theories mm-hmm. and the was it supernatural or illogical? Like I think in the movie, one of the characters, I think one of the gardeners or groundsmen says, "Oh, maybe they just fell down a hole or something mm-hmm. like that," and you don't know what happened. I'm like, well, did they just pass into some other realm? Or was it as simple as there was some big hole there that they fell down or something like that? But one of them came back. Yeah, so. to me, I think, the, especially like the first time I watched it, I just assumed that it was sort of a, like a gateway place to maybe another dimension or some kind of supernatural realm. And the way that they were sort of in a trance walking to it and then the humming that the rocks made and then the way that they reacted when they got to that circular area where they all fell asleep and then walked up into the crevice and that edith is the only one that's like what are you doing we can't go up there so i felt like it was definitely there was some sort of supernatural element but it seemed to be something that was tied to miranda too because she where they leave, she's, I'm not coming back. <laughs> yeah, there's a few times where she says things in the film and it's almost like foreshadowing. Yes, um, yeah. I think early, I'm trying to remember what she says. She says something very early in the film. I think she says to Sarah that she's not going to be here for long. There's one thing. Yeah, yeah she says and you're going to have to find a new love because I won't be here yeah. much longer. <laughs> yeah, and does that mean she's leaving the school or does that mean she knows that she's about to pass into something? And then the way that she waves when they're leaving to go on the right. walk, it's all very, it's all very interesting. And yeah, it's great how it's open for that interpretation. Yeah. Even the thing that she says about all things begin and end at the right time or something like that, that felt very tied to some sort of unconscious knowledge of what yeah. they were going into. <laughs> and then when Michael's searching for her later, which is was a really good scene as well. And he almost gets taken as well, I think, mm-hmm. because he does the same thing. He comes to the circular area and falls asleep, and he gets found eventually by what's the guy? What's John Jarrett's character's name? Is it? Oh, I forgot the name. But uh, he gets found. Is Albert. Right? Albert. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. And he gets found by John Jarrett or Albert, and he looks like he's in some sort of comatose state. Like right. He's had a very right. close en- encounter with this thing, whatever it is. Yeah. But it's shown that he's got a piece of one of the, the dresses in his hand. And uh, mm-hmm. so he got very close. And obviously we find out later that when Albert goes back and finds one of the girls and brings her out and they don't know what happened to her. She doesn't remember anything, which is really interesting. And then the connection with Miranda and the swans all the time. Did you remember that bit? You see when Michael's looking at different times and 
he'll see Miranda or he'll have a thought of Miranda and then he'll see a swan. I'm like, is there some sort of connection here? Or I thought maybe it was just because swans are considered really beautiful and sort of regal yeah. and aloof birds. I don't know. It, I guess it fit that way. I don't like birds, so I... <laughs> I, I don't like swans and swans are mean by the way so i never think of them as being these as really a, graceful yeah. things but i think that's yeah. the way they're viewed by everybody else with those scenes as well i believe because of the version i saw there's scenes is there scenes existing where michael is interacting with miranda because it seems like he knows her more than just infatuated with her just seeing her on the day because in the version I watched, all he's doing is sitting with Albert, having a drink, and he sees the girls crossing the little bit of river. The little, the little. That's yeah, that's the version that I watched, and he like imagines her being at his house, looking over her shoulder. Yeah, and she's not really there, obviously, and he sort of has these almost as if he is in touch with her telepathically, where he has these memories of things that were yeah. said the day that she was at the rock but that's more when he's in that circular area so there's some sort of supernatural connection some there stuff. i think i just know that like sofia coppola was inspired by this movie to make virgin suicides and there's a okay. the big plot point of that is that there's these boys that watch a group of sisters that live across the street and they've never talked to them but they create this fantasy version of them in their heads based on the little bit that they do see and i almost think he's doing that i think he's he's creating this fantasy version of her based on right. seeing her that for that brief period of time. So he's, he's actually looking for her at the rock, obviously, and he's obsessed with her kind of thing or infatuated, right. probably a better word. Obsessed is probably a more pro word, but yeah. And the scene where they're crossing the river is quite funny because it's got that line from John Jarrett where they're crossing over and John Jarrett says something about their legs going right up to their butt or something like that. Uh -huh. And Michael says to him, oh, I wish you wouldn't talk like that. And uh, he says, I talk it, you just think it, or something like right. that. Right, yeah. yeah. And the other thing, when there's a lot of themes of femininity in this film yeah. as well, oh, yeah. which I think is really interesting, which obviously as a as an older bloke, I probably don't really understand as much. But from this, I see there's themes that run through it that are quite interesting in the whole femininity side of things. There's a first, obviously, there's that, infatuation sarah has with miranda mm. and then and the way the girls turn on one of their own when she comes back and sees them again yeah there's some interesting stuff there because um i i think that the hanging rock location itself represents a sense of freedom for them because literal freedom from the school because they're in a different location and their headmistress isn't there and then also, like, she makes a comment, like, once you get past this point, you can take off your gloves. Yeah. You're having to wear these heavy white cotton gloves in the middle of summer, I imagine. And they get to take those gloves off once they're away from society, which they're very excited about. And I yeah. would be, too, because that doesn't look fun. And then when the girls go up to the actual rock, once they are sort of in the trance that they're going to go through the crevice, they take off their stockings and shoes. Yeah, and tie them around their waist and Edith is horrified by this but it is like this sense of freedom like where we're going we don't need this stuff and yeah. we can also just be ourselves and we don't have to cover up so yeah. I think yeah. there's elements of that I also think that somehow the the rock represents this lack of oppression that they've been feeling at the school or just in society in general when Irma comes back and ta to say goodbye to everyone she is dressed like a grown up. Like she has her hair pinned yeah. up and she's wearing very grown up clothes and they're in a very rich red. And the rest of the girls are wearing their school uniforms and look much younger. So that struck me when they were, what happened? Where are they? And they attack her. Yeah. Like she is, she physically looks separate from them too. That scene is amazing because like she comes back and I think she's half expecting them to just be happy that she's back yeah to fauna and over her to, and stuff. yeah and really what happens is they kind of it sounds like they blame her for what happened or they just want to know what happened and there's like this hysteria 
yeah. there's like this shot of one of the girls screaming and shaking her head like in a real hysterical way. I think it is the not knowing. I think they're like, N- we have to know. You can't, you were there. Tell us what happened. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And then there's that whole scene once again. It, it, that scene is topped off with, with seeing Sarah basically tied to this apparatus that's supposed to help us stand straight or something. Right. It's just so terrible. The whole thing is yeah. just awful. Oh, yeah. And I think we get a glimpse that maybe she's been otherized from the other girls yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Because clearly this is not the first time she's been tied to that thing. Yeah. Yeah. And she also is, she's one of the few girls that have dark hair. Most of the other girls are blonde or, or have lighter hair and she has very dark hair. And so that really sets her apart visually as well. The music in this movie is fantastic. I, yes. I it. Yeah. It was beautiful score. Oh yeah. The score, the, the George Sanfir, um, panpipe piece it's so tied to this film in australia if you hear that piece of music in australia mm-hmm. the first thing you think of most people especially in my generation the first thing they think of is this movie right and because it's just it was it's so connected to this film but the music is fantastic there's bits of music where the girls are climbing the rock mm-hmm. and some of the music to me is almost goblin yeah dawn of the dead there's those that string that's kind of string sound, that dun and the boof that you know, goes underneath all that. And I was like, oh, yeah. this is just like Goblin, right? It's- it reminded me almost a com- of a combination of that and then the score for Haunting of Julia is a yeah. really early synth score. Okay. And so it sounds very otherworldly because it's not quite the synth that you're used to from the 80s. Yeah. But it's got elements of that. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. The sounds are just amazing and... The music's nice. The piano pieces are really nice. And they use a lot of stock music. There's some some classical music in there yeah. that they use. But it's the soundtrack to this film is great. I really like it. I've been actually, there's no soundtrack for this film officially. Right. There's a playlist on Spotify that's called Picnic of Magna Rock. And it's got most of the pieces in it. Mm-hmm. And it's really, no, it's really nice to listen to while you're working, actually. <laughs> it's kind of relaxing. <laughs> I watched the movie again last night and I had it. On the surround sound and turned up really loud, and I was like, "Man, this score rules!" <laughs> yeah, the score is great. It's really good. I love the score. It's, a, it's just a really good film. Yeah. What else was I going to talk about? Like I said, it, it just the whole movie is just so open for interpretation. The whole thing. Mm-hmm. There's so many questions in this movie. It's, it's actually, in a way, almost not difficult to talk about. It's easy to have this conversation, but it's difficult because you. There is no end to the movie, and I think that's the big thing, right? Yeah, and the story structure is very loose, too. Like, beyond the girls going to the rock and then going missing, everything else is sort of just, like, what is happening to to the people at the school and the fallout from that, but it's very nebulous. I I think it is hard to talk about because so much of the storytelling is really visual. Yeah. Do you have an idea of what you think happened at the end? <laughs> oh, I don't really know. And then there's the whole bit with Mrs. Appleby, right? What happened oh, yeah. to her? Because there's a whole ending that isn't in the version I watched, which was in the original, where she actually walks up the up to the the rock as well. Did you have that ending in yours? Or did the you ending see the that same I had version? ends with her sort of in what looks like morning clothes. Yeah. And then a voiceover comes over yeah, and says. That's what I had as well. But uh, yeah, the original apparently had her going dead. up the rock herself. Like you see yeah. her going up the rock and oh, getting wow. to the top. Okay. And then they have the voiceover at the end. There's like a freeze frame. But I think the ending on obviously what's like the director's cut is much better because that look on her face is just just amazing and because it's and this is where i think you get the idea of did sarah jump or was she pushed kind of thing because mm-hmm. she knows what's about to happen and she got all the bags packed and everything because obviously everyone's yeah leaving, and all the bags are packed she knows that sarah's dead she must know right because right, she, she was to, she yeah. told everyone she saw her go off and right. she obviously didn't go off right yeah and she's just sitting there in these morning clothes and it's just and it's a great last scene, and I can see why Peter Weir changed it to that, and because it looks, I don't know, it's just like in the voiceover, and mm-hmm. where it explains what happened to her, and it's a really good ending. And there's a screaming outside the door before. Yes, yeah. The guy comes in. I'm wondering who that screaming is. Whether it's 
I assumed it was one of the teachers. Maybe yeah. that he came and said, hey, I just found this girl outside and it's her reaction. Yeah. yeah. And that whole lead up to that scene where the guy, the, the greenkeeper, goes mm-hmm. into his greenhouse and sees the broken glass first and then sees the bit of wood and right. eventually then just see her body there. And it's really well put together. But that last scene is great. It's really good. I love it. Yeah, there's really... I don't know. You just got to see the movie, I think. If you haven't seen this movie, it's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, I agree. And I think, especially for if you're in the US, it's on Max. And if you have a subscription, it's right there for you. And yeah. then also the Criterion. Criterion also always packages things beautifully. I think there is a, a, a little making a featurette on the second disc of the right. one I got. And mine came with the book. That That's a pretty good deal. <laughs> It is a good deal. Yeah, it's really good. I'm really liking it. I'm liking looking at some of these films. When I think about where my podcast started and where I am now, I was like, I would never have thought of doing Picnic at Hanger Rock. Right. Because right. at the start, I was like, oh, I'm just going to do all this exploitation stuff and blah, 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 and all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, Ugh. It, it, you get to a point where you go, well, I would just want to expand things a little bit. Then you expand it a bit further and a bit further. And then we end up talking about Young Einstein. Then we talk about Picnic yeah. at Hanger Rock. and. What's next? Crocodile Dundee. No, <laughs> not at the moment. I don't think that. But, but, but yeah, it's a really intriguing, but it fits in. It's not Ausploitation as such, but it's in that, the start of that like new wave sort of. Australian art house, which was definitely something that, that was a big deal in the 70s and 80s. Like that's oh, yeah. where Mad Max comes from and all. Yeah, and they call this, there's a lot of people that call this Australian Gothic, this film. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. that's good. Yeah, yeah it feels very like, much like a Gothic yeah. story. Yeah. The other thing I didn't realise until I was having a look around just say looking at some different things is there was a stage production of this back in 1970. Really? I uh, wonder 80, how they would do that. 2017, <laughs> 2018. They showed bits of it. It was like a little promo thing. Uh-huh. people's reaction to it it looked really interesting how it was done but most people they were interviewing when they were coming out of the the play was saying that it was eerie and it was like quite scary and it wasn't what they expected and i was like oh this would have been really good to see at the time right? yeah that's cool that sounds cool and that was back in 2017 so there must be a there's obviously a treatment for stage for this hanging around it'd be interesting to see someone revive it or and there's like also that. a mini series from t- 2018 although i think it it has a very different feel. Like I started watching it just to compare. Yeah. And it's, I, I think what works about the movie is that it, it is this like sort of brief snapshot yep. into this area and these girls' lives. And the miniseries, obviously, because it's longer, goes much more into Mrs. Affleyard's backstory and the backstory of some of the girls. I don't even know if you need that. I think. Yeah. The the sure. way that it works as a mystery is that you don't really know anything. And that's what makes it interesting, <laughs> right? That's what makes it good. And yeah, I, I think sometimes that's a sin of remaking or turning things into longer series. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> is that you get too much information and you're like, I don't need all this. And it doesn't ruin it because the original movie is always there to return to. Right. But, but it takes away something about the film. To, to me, when you go too deep into these sort of things, I don't know, some do it well. Like I remember seeing Bates Motel, which I thought was quite good. Yeah. But but because I think in that case, the story of what happens with Norman Bates, and this is the lead up to see how he got there. So there's always that interest to see, okay, how did we get to this point? But with, and, and like I said, I haven't seen it. You've seen a bit of it. But with a re, like a remake or a, a series for this movie and and they're going to start looking deeply into each of the characters. To me, that's a bit of a turn off. Yeah. And especially the way that they present Mrs. Appleyard, she's, I don't want to give anything away in case people want to watch it, but she's almost presented like a con woman. She's not who she says she is. Right. Yeah. And, um, and and so the mystery becomes more about who she is than like the central mystery of the girls disappearing. And once again, I don't think it's a film that would be worth remaking. I'm sure one day someone's going to go, let's remake Picnic and Hanging Rock. But I don't know how you get that, the feeling and the atmosphere from the original and put it with, I don't know, sometimes when I look at these older movies and they remake them, 
the biggest problem to me is the equipment they're using now versus what they're using then. That's true, yeah. And that's what gives it a lot of the feel, especially mm-hmm. those seventies movies and the eighties movies. Yeah. And they remake them and they're all made with digital cameras and digital this and digital that. And to me that just makes it just like a I don't know, like a plastic toy. Yeah, it, it doesn't have the same atmosphere for sure. I I think it's it's like Suspiria. I never thought they could remake Suspiria because it's just such a singular thing. And really the only way they were able to remake it as successfully as they did is they changed. They kept the basic story and they changed almost everything else. Like it's not right. the same feel or the same atmosphere and they took it a different way and all this stuff. I think you almost have to do that because with something as iconic as Suspiria or Picnic at Hanging Rock, if you try to remake it exactly, it's you're always going to have it being compared to the original because the yeah. original did it right the first time. Exactly. Like when they remade Psycho. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's some remakes that work, and I know we're getting off the subject here, but you know, when I look at genre remakes that, for me, worked, was things like Evil Dead worked Mm -hmm. because i think they tried they took a slightly different bent and different look at it but but that really wasn't a remake that was definitely just like a reimagining or a right um, or something like this might not be a popular opinion but i thought the fright night remake did some interesting things with the fright night story i don't think it was better but at least it felt like a successful remake (laughs) Yeah, yeah but back to this movie for me, it's definitely a, a must-watch. If you've got access yeah. to it, it's really worth watching. If you're expecting it to be like a, a scary movie, it's not a scary movie. No. Definitely unsettling, yeah. <laughs> right? There's lots of it's unsettling. It's very unsettling, parts. and yeah. they, there are sort of horror elements to it, but I would not say it's a horror movie. It's not even really a thriller. It's it's like an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Kind it's a of, drama, right? It's a, beautiful a drama. Way. Yeah. yeah. It's a drama with supernatural overtones. Yeah, that's the way I'd yeah. put it. Yeah, and it seems like people have been trying to figure out what is the ending because there there was a book in 1980 written by a woman named Yvonne Rosso called "The Murders at Hanging Rock," where she explores the different theories people have put out about what happened to the girls. And there's a parallel universe, UFO abduction, the fact that that they were murdered by two men and their bodies are still there somewhere, and then the actual author of picnic at hanging rock wrote a book called the secret of hanging rock it was actually the last chapter that like her publishers made her cut off the end and if you want to know what the ending would be uh, some people just want to preserve the mystery you want to know what the ending would be i would look that up because it explains how joan Lindsay thought the book should end okay that's interesting i might have to check that out maybe i don't know some part of me doesn't want to know yeah right (laughs) It That's was, what I had it written out, but I was like, I don't know if I want to tell people because some yeah. people might not want to know. Anyway, so that's Picnic at Hanging Rock. I hope you uh, enjoyed listening to that. It was, like I said, it's, a, it's an interesting one to talk about. It's definitely not one of those movies we can sit here and talk beat by beat because I think it would just get really boring. To oh, start yeah, it. and it would never do it justice. So you just got to no, watch it. <laughs> you just got to watch it. So tell me a little bit what's going on with you, Tab, and where people can find you. Okay. If you want to listen to me talk about horror movies, I have a podcast called Test Pattern that just ended last year, but there's tons and tons of episodes. So there's you can work through the backlog of that. And then I currently have a panel podcast with a bunch of other people where we talk about femme representation in media and we're a intersectional feminist podcast. So we have a lot of different viewpoints in that. And that's called the Stiletto Banshees. And It's been really fun. We only have a couple episodes out right now, but we're putting out more. And we're also hosting Monster Kid Marathon this year. So we're doing a lot of horror movie lists. But yeah, you can find me at Horror Flick Tab on Instagram. And you can find the Stiletto Banshees at the Stiletto Banshees on Instagram and threads. And then we just got on Blue Sky, thanks to Pete. (laughs) (laughs) And I think we're just Stiletto Banshees on that. So. It's a bit quiet over there, but I'm I'm hoping it'll pick up. And Yeah, I, I think because it's invite only, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, they haven't really opened it to everyone. I only got in through an invite. And yeah. it seems like once you've been, it almost seems once you start interacting and doing things after a few weeks, you usually get an invite to hand out to someone else. Yeah. But yeah, I, I hope it takes off or I hope it works because 
Twitter or whatever it's called these days is like <laughs> a cesspool and yeah, I'm only yeah, on there because it's, slow down. Yeah, you, <laughs> I'm only on there because you have to be in a way right. to, to do some promotion. I still do a fair bit through Facebook with the page, but it's hard and all the monster kids have gone or there's only a few left and there's not much conversation there anymore like it used to be which right. is a bit sad. Yeah. So I think when I sent you the invite, I was like, oh, it would be great if we could eventually get everyone over there again and we could yeah. sort of get that community happening again. Because Yeah, exactly. It was really great. But, but yeah, I, lo- I love the Stiletto Banshees. It's great. I'm, I'm probably most of the way through the carry episode at the moment. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's really good. I'm really enjoying that. It's, oh, it's good. Really good. Yeah. So it's interesting because the way you position the podcast, it's almost like you would think, and don't take this the wrong way, please, that it's just for women. Right. And, but it's not. If you're a bloke, you can get a lot out of this. And it's really good getting, like you said, this feminist perspective on things. Right, yeah. Which, and this is part of the thing that's wrong with Twitter. There's nothing wrong with having these perspectives that are not your own, right? How I don't you understand learn. This. Exactly. It's exactly how you learn. Yeah. And, and all these people that put that stuff down really bug me. But... Yeah, it's really good. And just listening to you guys talk about Carrie is really great. So Yeah, exactly. We are just talking about the films the way we would on Test Pattern too. We just yeah. all happen to be femme people yeah. or have an experience being perceived as a, a femme person. We also have a trans man on the show. So it it's more just about like how we see these things as women in within a conversation overall about whatever yeah. we're talking about. It's really good. I really enjoy it. It's great fun. Yeah, yeah. It's. Excellent. I'm hoping we get a, a very large audience. So like you said, yeah. it's not just for women. It's for anybody who wants to see things from a different perspective and hear a bunch of fun people talk about movies. So what What do you got? Have you got anything interesting coming up that you can talk about? Oh, yeah. We just recorded an, uh, an episode on the lesbian vampire trope. So we talked about uh, Daughters of Darkness, uh-huh. The Hunger, and a movie that came out more recently called Bit. And so with our trope episodes, we usually talk about the trope as a whole, and then we do a deeper dive using a couple of examples. And so that was a really fun episode. And we got to talk a lot about, a lot of it was just gushing about how beautiful the movies were, like Picnic at Hanging Rock. So that that was really fun. (laughs) Great. Excellent. It's always great having you on. It's always so good having your perspective. And I know you put a lot of, even when I asked you to come on to this show, you put a lot of work in the background oh, and prepared. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. It's fantastic. Oh, not thank that, you. But, I love talking about movies, so yeah, I go yeah, over it. <laughs> now, not to say that all my other guests don't prepare. I'm just saying. Oh, of course. It's, it's very obvious with you. I share the notes with you and there's always extra bits in there and things like yeah. that. So it's really good. All right. So thanks so much for coming on. Yes. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. Thank you to all my guests who give their time to make this podcast possible. And a special thanks to you for listening. Don't forget you can follow a Dingo Ate My Movie on social media. We're at Dingo Movie on Twitter, Dingo Movie Pod on Facebook and Instagram, and we're on the web at dingomoviepod.com. If you'd like to support the show, leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, or share the show with your friends. Of course, you can always buy me a coffee over at buymeacoffee.com slash dingomoviepod. Once again, thanks for listening, stay safe, and I'll see you on the next episode of A Dingo Ate My Movie.